welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, the type of thing I want to cover, I think, actually is going to address most of your concerns. One of the most common questions I saw is, what, are your, what if you're new, what should I do? What if I'm uh, just getting started, what should I do? Uh, how do you deal with multiple offers? Uh, it was, part of it is like the first thing to understand is that the market is constantly shifting. Uh, I've been doing this 42 years. When I say the market is constantly shifting, sometimes the shifts are very slow, but the market is constantly shifting. It, it's not a static thing. What regulates prices, and prices are always a lagging indicator, never a leading indicator. What regulates prices is supply and demand, period. And, but that comes after the factors that cause it to go up and down. Right now, we have uh, either the uh, number one or the number two market in the country, whether it's us or Austin, and the Phoenix Business Journal just did a thing going, why aren't and they quoted a couple of people of how saying we were actually ahead of Austin, if you really think it over. And I'm thinking that is one of the more idiotic contests you could have, in my opinion. Uh, the, the thing we have, when well, you have the sim a similar market, but it's happening all over the country, there is a shortage of inventory. Uh, in the Arizona Realtors Forum, I kept seeing comments from people about what are we going to do? There was one woman who wrote in literally, what are we going to do about this shortage of inventory? The builders aren't going to fix this. Do we just keep talking about it in the forum? And I'm thinking, what the hell do you think you're going to do about it? Like there's a scarcity of inventory and that's a fact. It isn't an opinion. It isn't like something that maybe there's a shortage of inventory. Why is there a shortage? This is not some mysterious thing. It's because buyers have come out of the woodwork because interest rates are so low. The first house I bought was 13% interest and it had come down to 13. So the, the house I live in, I've gotten it, had an assumable VA loan on it for eight and a half percent. Back then, eight and a half percent practically seemed like free money to me. The current rate for 30 year fixed is some, some number under three. That's crazy. And it's not going to last. As the rates go up, will the market dampen a little bit? Yes, hallelujah, it will. But supply isn't going to surge. Now, there's a scarcity because we have all these buyers that want to get a house while the getting is good. And we have fewer sellers because some of them are scared because of COVID. And some of them are just like, well, we don't need to move because where, are we, where, where can we go and buy something? The thing that is interesting is the market conditions are constantly changing. Interest rates are constantly changing. Those changes in interest rates are usually referred to as basis points, which is one one hundredth of a percentage, but it's constantly shifting and you don't control that and you don't control the inventory and you don't control the demand. You, you never have and you never will. The one thing, I mean, if you say, what does, it, what does a buyer, what does a seller want from an agent? Well, they want honesty. They wanna be able to like and trust the person, but there's actually a fundamental thing that buyers and sellers want from an agent that they don't really have, and that is market knowledge. We are, we are blessed here in the Valley, in my opinion, just literally blessed because we have Michael Orr in the Cromford Report. I had a fellow write to me about, I don't know, a week, 10 days ago saying he had heard me say blah, 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 get the Cromford Report, and he got it, and he's been looking at it, and he thought, I don't see how it's gonna help me get more listings. It's not going to help you get more listings. I said, it's going to help you to talk to people if you're informed, if you understand what it says. And I told him to go to our, my blog, the Russell at nohasslelistingblog.com and read four or five of the articles there to see how we incorporate uh, the Michael Orr's data into the data we disseminate. But it's fantastic information. 
And if you actually take the time to learn what Michael's saying and learn to understand it in the relationship, just take that market snapshot and look it over and learn what those numbers mean, you're actually a pretty well-informed agent. And that is the number one thing that buyers and sellers want is information and they can't get that. You can say, well, they can go to Zillow. If Zillow says something that's true, it's an accident. It's, it's literally a fluke. Uh, they, they have the most idiotic, and I'm not talking about their home valuation system. I'm talking about the drivel that they spew out as data as though they know what they're talking about. One of the things, they had a book that came out a couple of years ago where they actually said that uh, when people bought homes near a, I think it was Trader Joe's, uh, what's that stupid coffee? Starbucks, that, that overpriced coffee was Starbucks, Trader Joe's and some other company. And any, if you bought in one of those neighborhoods, your, your, your property would go up more. So it, it, the implication was wherever a Trader Joe's or a Starbucks went in would cause property values to skyrocket. I thought, yes, why don't you stick a Starbucks down say at 16th Street and Broadway and see how fast property prices drive. It's just gibberish. It never seemed to occur to them that Trader Joe's and Starbucks are really, really good on picking locations. It, it wasn't the other way around, but, they, but they're stupid. And they, they have failed. By the way, Zillow's never made a profit, never. They've never made a profit. And now they've dropped into, they've become a brokerage, which was the thing they'd promised, by the way, they would never do, and they've become a brokerage. What do I think of that? What am I gonna do about it? Nothing, it's stupid. They do not have some advantage in the marketplace. Zillow owns search, but you can go, well, they're gonna keep all the leads and give them to Zillow agents. We're not getting them, we weren't getting them anyway. And it, it doesn't matter what they're doing because we're, it, it, it's, not, it's not relevant. What is relevant is you have the deal you have. One time I was on a panel and I can't remember, I remember Joanne Calloway, um, I don't remember who else, there were four of us. There was some agent, I don't, she wasn't like that big an agent, but I remember Joanne was there and I think Bill Ryan. But anyway, what was fantastic is the moderator, uh, this was about, I think 2008 or 2009. And the moderator said, what was your favorite market? And Joanne said, oh, 2005, uh, that was just fantastic. We loved it. That, that was the most profitable year she'd ever had, her and Joseph. And he asked all the other people and they took the bait and answered the stupid question. And I was the last person he asked. And I said, it's a stupid question and I'm not going to answer it. You do not have a choice on the market. And what I accused him of, and I wasn't backing down, was you're putting people's attention on what market would they prefer to this one? Do you have a choice? You're in this one. This is the deal. And when someone takes the viewpoint that they don't like this deal, they just became a victim. And things happen to a victim. You understand what I'm saying here? To succeed in any market, you cannot be a victim you would have to take the viewpoint of a winner. And winners take counter, and counter efforts in the environment and use them to their advantage. I wanna say that again. A low-toned person suffers from counter efforts. Something happens in the environment, and they're like, now look what happened to me. A high-toned person finds a way to use the counter efforts to their advantage. So somebody could go, we only have, I don't know what the number is, 3,000 listings total for all of armless, or 3,300 or some number like that. If you take out the, if you just look at really what's for sale that's here in the valley, it's, it's around 3,300, something like that. <coughs> and they're like, what's supposed to be about 30,000 and, and 15,000 would be a barely, a barely acceptable number. Well, what a stupid thing to fixate on. If let's say there's 3,000 houses for sale total, 
do you have 3,000 customers? Do you, if, if you have less than 3,000, whatever the number is, there's enough for you to make a sale. If you take the viewpoint, you're going to do just that. You cannot go into agreement that there's something, there's some exterior influence that's wrecking it for you and you can't succeed because of it, because that is a failure viewpoint. And if you take that kind of viewpoint or keep that kind of viewpoint, you are going to fail. 13 out of 14 agents that come into the real estate business are gone by the end of 18 months, they're gone. And if you doubt those numbers, just look at the number of people getting their license and look at the number of active agents and do the math and you'll go, yeah, that's really the deal. And most of the people who are licensed aren't doing any deals anyway. Now you can decide, well, this is, it's a condition you can't do something about, but that's a lie. It's not true. If you're looking for excuses to fail, you won't have to look far to find people who will agree with you. Those are awful conditions and they would be conducive to you failing. You, you, if, you, if you see, well, look, there's hardly any houses and uh, people are telling you there's 15 offers on the houses that are there. Uh, you can see the problem, can't you? And you can find people, and especially sit, sit around some real estate office and go, you, you see how awful that is? It won't take you long to find people who will go, oh, you're right, we're fucked. But, but that's not where you want to go. That's not your, is, is it is your goal? If you have a secret death wish, this is a, it's a wonderful way to dramatize it and succeed at like failing. But if that's not your goal, then don't be in agreement that there's anything that could stop you from succeeding. It's just that simple. And you go, well, it's easier to say that than to do it. Well, of course it's easier to say it than to do it. If it was really easy, everyone would succeed. See, when someone who isn't out trying to find a customer or trying to get an offer accepted, they're in sort of an ivory tower. But there's a concept if you don't ever want to get hit, don't get in the ring. When you're out there on the firing line, you're going to get bruised. You're going to get smacked. I'm not talking some physical violence thing. I'm talking about you're going to have losses on a weekly, if not on a daily basis. One of the questions, I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but it was in effect, how do you maintain a positive attitude? How do you keep up in terms of your attitude? How do you maintain a positive attitude at all, all the time? You don't. The trick is how rapidly can you get back on track? So let's talk about a little bit about things you could go that you would seem to have nothing to do with real estate and success in real estate, but actually they have everything to do with real estate and success in real estate. Of the critical skills, of the skills that matter the most for success, you could take all of the, the things that a real estate agent has to know to succeed and there is one that stands head and shoulders above the rest of them combined. And if you're good at that one skill, you are going to succeed no matter how awful you are at the other, say, six or seven. If you're bad at that skill or don't get good at it, you will fail no matter how good you are on the other skills. What is that skill? Lead generation. The ability to get and keep a customer. There's nothing that compares to that one. So if you say, well, there's lead generation is not the same thing as lead conversion. Agents have been in the business a while tend to be astoundingly good at lead conversion because they have to be because they're so God awful at lead generation. <laughs> but if you're good at lead generation, 
you could actually not worry about lead conversion. You would still make a good living. And if you said, well, I don't know how to do this, or I don't know how to write a contract and so forth, it doesn't matter. In Callaway's office, to use an example, they have a rule. If it's paper, it's Joseph. If it's people, it's Joanne. And this was really, she wasn't allowed to touch papers. And, and it, was a, it was a rule. Joseph was very methodical, attention to detail. If you were good enough at lead generation, let's pretend you didn't know how to do contracts. You didn't know how to do a bin theory. You didn't. You could hire someone fresh out of law school for 50 grand a year and just say, whenever I go someplace, you come with me, don't talk. And anything that needs to be written, filled out or thing, you do it. I'm not making a joke. You could actually know nothing and have someone. And you, if you've got somebody who finished law school, got their JD, they would know how to fill out the form. Even if they weren't an amazing lawyer, they wouldn't have to be to do that. The point I'm getting at is lead generation, getting and keeping customers. And it isn't something, it, it's something you can do. Now, there's two ways to do it. Of, of, of all the, th there's, there's, seems like there's a zillion people selling stuff like how to do this, how to do that. What is interesting, if you say that deal on getting customers, lead generation, you can either do it through marketing or you can do it through prospecting. That's the end of the list. You could take something like geographic farming and you could say that combines marketing and prospecting, but you're gonna get good at prospecting, marketing or begging. That's it, that's the end of the list. So to make a career, you would have to be able to, when you're starting, if you don't have a lot of money for marketing, in fact, if you did have a lot of money for marketing, you'd still be better off to learn to prospect because you'd waste all the money doing the wrong kind of marketing anyway. So when you're marketing, you're trying to do something to get the customer to reach to you, but if your ad isn't perfect, it won't work or it's the wrong medium or it's said wrong. But with prospecting, you can find out if your offer is good or bad almost on the spot. You say something, you go, would you like a CMA? And they go, I don't think I want that. Would you like a right price analysis? Yes, I want that. But my point is you get this instantaneous feedback that would tell you is what you're offering something they like or not. Any questions so far that you're getting, Kelly, anything? Nope. Um, people wanted to know what blog you were referring to. So I just Googled what, it. Say it again. I couldn't hear. Oh, the blog that you referred to in the very beginning. Is that nohasslelistingblog.com? Yeah. If you go to no hassle listing and you cl click on blog, I think it's over by the top right hand corner and click on blog. It'll be, you'll see the no hassle listing blog. And uh, that's where the articles that we put in our papers uh, and, and we put them online there at the, the No Hassle Listing blog. The other URL I would recommend you get and, and go to, but not right this second, is number one homeagent.com. That's N U M B E R, the, the numeral one homeagent.com. That's my agent success guide. It is uh, everything you could possibly need or want to know for agent success is there, period. No modifier on that statement. The site is stupid looking, clunky, and poorly organized, but everything you would need to be successful is there, period. So you, you, there, there is nothing you could need to know to be a success in the re residential real estate business that I haven't written up or posted there on a video, nothing. There is just absolutely nothing you'd need to know ever. Um, you, you could say, well, the thing of the talk I gave 10 years ago on prices and this and that, well, yeah, the prices are different, but the fundamental, the, the, the points are that nothing's changed. So you could go there and have a free education. You could read the articles on the blog, on uh, the, the uh, No Hassle Listing blog that are aimed at sellers primarily, but it, it, you can see 
Wendy writes those. So I, I get credit for some of the graphics, but she writes those. It says Rus Russell and Wendy Shaw, uh, mostly Wendy, and it's really all Wendy. I just like to have it say mostly Wendy because I think it's so clever. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the truth is she gets credit for that. But my point is, if you want to see what the market's doing, you could almost always see it there. Um, and if you want to know what to do, part of this is like if, if you if you looked at Gary Keller's book, there's two books, actually three that he's written that I would go, you, you just they're indispensable. One was the Millionaire Real Estate Agent, which is the most best-selling real book for realtors ever. And I've seen people read it and go, well, it didn't tell me how to get business. No, that's not what it's about. It's not about how to get business. It's about how to become, make your job into a career and into a business. Um, I, I get people coming to me saying they want to sell their business. I had a friend, friend of mine, and he's really a nice guy, and he's very charming, handsome guy, very charming man. And uh, he, this a couple of years ago, or Houston's, and he says, I, my reason I wanted to have lunch with you, I wanted to talk to you about what I need to do to get my business where I could sell it. I said, you don't have a business, Tim. He said, what do you mean? I said, you have a job. Well, no, I want to sell it. You don't have something to sell. Your entire business is based on your charming quality when you go around and meet people and get them to like you and do business with you. That's not a business. You can make a lot of money, like he's, he's a very successful agent, and you can make a lot of money, but you're like you're in the same position a dentist or a medical doctor is. If you're not there doing it, you, you don't, you're not going to get paid. That's not a business. Get the difference. A business means you could be gone for a year and the business is still there. So a business is different, but right when you, that's what that book is about, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Um, there were 15 of us. People think that that book was like, there's, I'm, I'm quoted extensively in the book, but they think that this was a book that, uh, that Gary sat down to write uh, and, and then he just went and collected a bunch of crap and shoved our pictures in there. It was the other way around. They, he interviewed, or actually Dave Jenks did, but they, they interviewed people all over the country. And the ones that made the cut for the book were the people who had a replicatable system that someone else could use. There was a woman, I don't remember her name. I remember she was out of New Mexico and I think she was with Colwell Banker. And the year that that book was done, I think this would have been 2001 or two, and I really can't recall. But what I remember is she was not included in the book. Her commissions, the year that she was interviewed, her share, $4.5 million. She had 87 customers and she wasn't taking on new ones. That's not a replicatable system. No one's going to go, hey, I'll do that. No, you won't. You can't just go do it. So people like Mike Mendoza, Bill Ryan, uh, we were in the book. I'm just naming a few that were here. But what made it interesting is that we all, you could say, well, I was running TV ads and Bill was doing geographic farming, but we had systems that were replicatable. And that entire book was about what we all had in common. What did Mike Mendoza and me and Bill, just, what were we doing that someone could go, oh, I see the common denominator here. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So when you're getting started, the thing you're gonna to wanna to do is go see people, I, I, this, this, you could say I want to call them, go see people that you know a lot. You don't have to know them well, but go see them and let them know you're in the real estate business, that you, if they need to buy or sell a home, if they know anyone that needs to buy or sell a home, please keep you in mind. If you're new in the business, you used to do something else. And if you've been here in the Phoenix area for a while, you probably know 150 to 200 people on site. If they saw you, they'd go, oh, hi, uh, Ralph, good to see you. But they don't think of you as a realtor because you weren't a realtor. That's not how you met them. 
but you most certainly can drop around and see them, hand them a couple of, car of your cards and go, if you know anybody that needs to buy or sell a house, please keep me in mind. And if you f see some, if you would like to find them, because I'm so active in the market, if you would like me to let you know if I see a good deal, some such clever thing like that. But the point is go see them. Face to face, pop in, hi, not, not no appointment, just go see them. There isn't anything you're going to do that doesn't cost a lot of money that's going to get you business like that will. You go, well, most of them don't need to buy or sell a house. No, they really don't. But every one of them knows somebody who's going to buy or sell a house. Again, go see them. If you look at how most agents get most of their business, I could say, well, if you take someone who's a big, uh, let's say what Mike we used Mendoza, he was a geographic farmer at Mountain Park Ranch, or Callaway's in 85254. But the point is, if you say, how does the average agent, just, just not just in just a regular market, how do most agents get most of their business? The correct answer to that question is contacting people in their previously met database. I'm going to say that again. Contacting people in their previously met database. What if you say, I don't have a database? Well, pretend you'd had one. They're calling on people that they already slightly knew. And by doing that one action, one time when I was handling fixing my nephew when he was in the Glendale, California area, I think he was with Remax at the time. And I said, uh, I want to know how you, what your last, your last 10 sales. I want the, the stuff where I want every one of them, where, where the deal came from. He says, I don't know. I said, well, let's just take one deal. Where, where, how'd that customer come? Well, the guy called me and I said, well, how do you get your number? He said, I don't know. I said, call him, ask him. When? Call him now, call him. I want to know how, how, why did he call you? How did he get your number? And he goes, I, I don't know how he got my number. I believe you, but you have his number, call him. You, he, you, he, you, you, he bought a house from you, call him. And he, does, Dustin did, he called the guy up and asked him, he said, I wanna thank the person that sent you to me. And he, the guy gives him some name, somebody that get, told him to call. And then Dustin reports back to me and says that the, the other guy, just so-and-so, Joey called. He told Joey told him to call. I said, how did Joey know you? Dustin goes, I don't know. Awesome. Call Joey. How? On the phone. Call him on. Call Joey on the phone. I want to know how he got your number. And he did. And then he gets finds out it traced back to Dustin was out calling on people that he knew. And he gave a couple of cards to some guy that he knew. That guy gave one of those cards to one of his neighbors. Let's call that guy Joey. And that guy was the one that called the guy that bought the house from Dustin. But again, the activity that he was engaged in was contact, and he didn't have a database, but contacting people in his previously met database. That one action alone is the least expensive, most productive thing you could possibly be doing. And that's true regardless of market conditions. Any questions on anything, Kelly, that's come up, anything? No, a lot of thank yous for sharing all your knowledge and uh, people agreeing with what you're saying. Okay, anyone that tries to disagree, can they be punished? Uh -huh. I will just take them off the Zoom. Yeah, just, just just knock them or block them so where they can't see or hear. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, so again, you you want to be in communication with people. You won't necessarily get the business from the people you're, you you called on, but if you go out and call on people that you know, you don't have to know them real well. You just they, they go they, if your name is Bob and they saw you, go oh, hi Bob. That's that's good enough. Go see them and hand them a couple of your cards and go, I was just in the area and I wanted to pop by and give you a couple of my business cards. And you could go, 
well, I actually drove 10 miles to get there. Yeah, I know, but you just wanted to pop by and say hi. And don't stay long. You just wanted to let them know you're in the real estate business. And because they weren't thinking, that, go, you know, you're in the real estate. You know a lot of people who aren't thinking you're in the real estate business. I remember years ago when Remax first came to town. I mean, they'd been here, but I mean, when they came and it was like Remax was sort of a big, big deal. And people were joining Remax. And for the first time, and they were saying, oh my God, I'm getting so much business now. It's amazing because they were with Remax. So I looked into how were they getting all this business? Oh, it was ma magic. People who had not contacted their past clients in six or seven years, they're busy, you know, doing stuff. But now that they've moved and had a new office phone number, a new, with a different company, and they called all these people just to let them know I'm with Remax now. This is not some slam against Remax, that's not the point. The, the people that joined just that they were, they hadn't changed offices. So they were calling all their past clients to let them know, here's where you can reach me now. And like miracle, they got business from doing that. <laughs> so if you have past clients, you can call them. If you don't, if you're brand new, you don't have past clients, but you have people that you know. I remember when I was in the life insurance business, this is several lifetimes ago, I was young and there was a room full of us uh, and there was this really big shot agent from Flagstaff that had come down to give a talk to us. And uh, he was a nice man, I thought, but when I looked at time, I thought, does he have any idea how moronic this is? He was gonna help us do, do business. And he said, all he does, this is the guy who had been in the business, I was in the business at the time, three or four months, he was in the business, I think it was around 25 years at that time. And he said all he did to get business, and he was doing a lot of business, more than all of us in the room combined, he said he just had his secretary lay out on his desk five of his past clients every day, five days a week, and he would call them. And I thought, that's a fantastic system. I don't have an office. I don't have a secretary and I don't have, but about at that time, I think I had seven or eight past clients and I, they were my family and people that I knew really well. I thought, how the hell? But this was his idea of sharing with us. I thought, sharing what? Crap that doesn't apply. So the truth is sometimes you get people who are doing something well, but they have no concept of what it would take to the person they're talking to. I used to get people all the time right after that MREA book came out, Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Can I come to Phoenix? I'll pay you. I'll give you $3,000. Can I come shadow you for a couple of days? I'll give you $1,000, $2,000. I thought, no, I'm not going to take your money. And you, I don't want to do it. Well, why not? What do you, I said, because what you'll be seeing is that I usually sleep till around 10, 30 or 11. I come into the office and have my coffee and joke with my staff. What, do, what will you learn from that? <laughs> what, what are you gonna find out like, oh, I see, sleep in and then drink coffee and tell some jokes to the staff when you come in. I'll start doing that. Yeah, it's a great system. But what my point was, there's nothing for them to see that would matter. Um, there, there just isn't. There were some agents that had done a lot of business and most most of them had lied about how much they'd done and they, they, they would charge people a couple, 3,000 to come see them. But it would seem like nonsense to me because the truth of the matter is it doesn't mean don't hang around people who are doing a lot of business. I mean, when I was with part of Star Power, these were the top agents in the country. What was the magic of Star Power? Really, what was the magic of Star Power? When I got started with Star Power, my best year had been 38 deals. That was when I started of going to those seminars. And the guy who did that is Howard Brenton and he's been passed away for many years. But the point is, I would be talking to agents doing 100, 150, 200, 300, 400 deals. And when I finally got past, these wasn't, this wasn't some other type of being like an alien. This is just a person who was doing a lot more business than I was. 
in the same amount of time I was not doing it. And when I saw myself as being like them and as opposed to different from them, I started doing more business. I, I remember specifically being in a bar in Chicago, sitting there, this, I did that year 60 deals and the guy I was at the, in the bar with was named Vince Seamer. And he was out of uh, someplace in Indiana, I remember. But anyway, it was funny because he had done 180 deals. And uh, somehow the fact that I was making jokes and he was laughing, all of a sudden it dawned on me and I can't even explain it better than this. If Vince can do it, I can do it. Next year I did a hundred and did 125 and 130 and I popped it up to 200. But my point is you have to be able to see yourself doing more. And it's not some mysterious thing. You just decide that's me now. Like I remember teaching a class one time and uh, the guy said, and he had never made a hundred thousand in a year and he had his goal to make 800,000. And I said, I don't think that's a real goal for you. He says, why do you want to limit me? I said, I don't want to limit you, but I don't think you believe you can do 800. To you it's horse shit. So I can see it's horse shit. So if you have a goal you think is horse shit, you're not going to do it anyway. I said, why? And he goes, well, you're just trying to limit me. I said, no. Why don't you make the goal to do 100? And after you do 100, double it and then double it again and keep doing it. But don't make a goal that's so stupid you, don't, you can't believe it. There's a guy, he's dead now, his name was Roger Bannister. And what Roger was famous for is he was the first man in recorded history to run a mile in under four minutes. Now, what makes this amazing, he's in the history books for doing that. He was a medical student at the time and then he was a, became later a retired physician. He was in Great Britain. But what made this amazing is that Roger was the first person to ever do it where it was recorded. And Roger broke the four minute mile. Prior to Roger doing it, it was a well-known fact. A horse could do it, not a man. It was a fact. Here's what's interesting. In the 30 days after Roger did it, two other runners did it. Within 12 months of the time Roger did it, I believe the number was 19 total other runners broke the four minute mile. And you gotta ask yourself, was soup, did Super Wheaties come out right then? Or did it, was it something like when I was in that bar in Chicago and I went, Jesus, if, if Vince can do it, I can do it. So if Roger, these weren't people that were big heavy set men that did it, they were runners. But my point is every single one of them had to have the thought, something along the line of, there's no way Roger's faster than me. <laughs> If Roger can do it, I can do it. And that's the viewpoint. That is the correct viewpoint for anything you want to do. Does that make sense? Any, any questions that, if, that, that, that this is bringing up for you or anything, if you can let Kelly know, I'm not able to read this stuff. And, but, I, but if there's something that somebody that's not being addressed or it's not being covered and you want more info or a viewpoint on it, just if you can shoot something there to Kelly where she can see it and then she can tell me, I'd be happy to cover it. Russell, the only question right now, a little bit off the topic is um, at what point in your business did you recommend or do you recommend having an assistant? As soon as you possibly can, uh, the sooner the better. If you're doing 12, 13 deals a year, you don't need an assistant. Uh, when you get to around 25 deals, it's stupid for you to not have an assistant. One of the things that people do, and by the way, if you're doing interested in team building, if you Google my name and add the words team building, there's a YouTube video. I think this was from about 2011, but nothing's changed uh, on team building and the sequence. And <clears throat> so the thing I want to get at, though, is 
one of the most stupid things people have as a goal is I want to have a big team. And my response to that is, why are you insane? Um, why, why, it's, so, it's an idiotic goal. Why? Why would you want a big team? How about if you had, you designed it to where you could have some free time and make more money? But big team is not the goal. It's not having to work 24 hours a day for yourself. So the first thing to get rid of is paperwork, not bring on buyer agents. That is the most common error I see is people go out and want to hire a bunch of buyer agents. Buyer agents do not reduce your paperwork. They increase it. And if you are doing what I'm going to call dollar productive activities, I want to be real clear here now, if you're doing what I'm going to call dollar productive activities, you most certainly wouldn't be doing something that you could hire someone for $15 an hour to do. If you're doing dollar productive activities, your time couldn't be worth less than $100, frankly, unless you're a nincompoop, your time couldn't be less worth less than $200 an hour. So every time you're doing that kind of work, you just pissed away approximately $185. So the thing for you to do is get rid of paper first, all of it. Then stop working buyers, give those away to buyer agent, and only do listings and present contracts. Is that, is that uh, my uh, touching on this or did I miss the question and just said something so wonderful people needed to hear it? <laughs> that was excellent. No, perfect answer. Um, how, how large of a team do you have is a question. Uh, I have four buyer agents. I have uh, two of them are listers. So I have three listers, but two of those buyer agents are listers, listings that do listings too. And I have one lister that only does listing. So I have seven outside salespeople. I have, let's see, four, five, I'm sorry, five outside salespeople. And then I have, our staff is really thin now. I have Jean, um, she's been with me just under 20 years and Diana just under 20 years. And then Jace, uh, uh, Andrew, I think is about four years and does contracts and then me and Wendy. Um, and we're going to have to hire one more person. But the last time we had someone leave because she moved out of town, uh, we just didn't need to hire anyone right away because the market where our business has slowed down so much. Uh, I mean, we've had months where we were like at nine listings we took uh, one month, I think it was November, we took one uh, you know, normally for us, it's like 25, that kind of thing. So it's been just slim pickings right now. I mean, everything sells, but still, it's not that much business. Did I answer that question for you on how big my team was? I think so. I, say it again, honey. Yeah, I think you did good. Okay, I get, I did good. I want that you note. You did very well, sir. Yeah. You know, <laughs> So again, what you're looking at here is if you go back to that website, uh, number1homeagent.com, and in the search bar, the little search box up there in the right-hand corner, type in the words enemy line, enemy line. And there's two posts that'll come up. Do the older one first. This must be done in writing. You take the goal and you state it as though it's a done deal. Like if let's say your goal was to, I don't know, sell 50 houses in a year. So it would be stated, I close over 50 escrows a year, the buyers and sellers. I close over 50 deals a year. Not that you're going to, now you're going to have these thoughts come up of, well, I'm sort of lying. That's not true. And you take all the thoughts, you take the goal that you want and state it as though it's a done deal, a completely done deal. None of this every day and every way I'm getting better and better. It's just done. It's a, it's, it's a fact. And then any thought you have that comes into your head 
on how it's not a fact, you write that down. All of your dumb ideas, all of them. And I've had people say, what do you do with the list? Burn it? No, no, you're going to want to keep it. Why would I want a list of negative thoughts? Well, how the hell do you think you got the negative thoughts? Here's a little secret for you. If you've had children, you probably recall, unless they're little now and you can remember, yeah, this is the deal, that no matter what was wrong, and they're squawking about this and squawking about that, and the kid doesn't like this, and that's wrong, is if you would feed them and put them to bed, it fixed the problem. 95% of the time, no matter what it was, feed them, put them to bed. So someone who's tired or hungry, little kid, they get cranky and they start yelling, screaming and crying and so forth. Do you think it's all that different for an adult? Seriously. So unless you have some magic system where you're never gonna get tired or hungry, because that's when those dumb ideas come floating right back. So you're gonna wanna have some way of knowing where that's why every one of those Dumbo thoughts gets in writing separate from you, where you can remember, oh yeah, that dumb idea. Well, I don't have a Mercedes or whatever the hell it is. I don't have a fancy suit. Uh, it, it, any thought you have that would be a barrier to your success, you could almost turn it around and take the goal that you want, whatever the goal is, whatever the goal is, and then reframe it to what would I need to believe in order to achieve that goal? I'm gonna say that again. You take the goal that you want and in order for it to be a goal, it needs to be exact and specific and something you could check off as a done, some vague crap like, I wanna be rich. What the hell does that mean? I mean, seriously, how much is rich? 4,000, 400,000, 4 million, it, it's, it'll change anyway. You people think, oh my God, a millionaire. A million, when you have a million, it doesn't seem like that much. It only seems like a lot when you don't have it yet. Once you have it, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's nothing. I mean, seriously. So you go, you take the thing you want and you make the statement mentally and, and in writing, I'm doing, 50 deals a year. Then you take all the dumb thoughts you have on why you can't and write them all out. And that becomes, and you, if you do this correctly, you will literally find yourself laughing or crying because you won't know. It's like, oh my God, that one was so stupid. Yeah, they're all stupid, but some of them are more easily recognizable as stupid. I remember one time, I don't remember what city I was in, and this lady, uh, Sandra was her name, and she said, uh, but what, Russ, wait just a minute. Uh, she was from Alabama, I remember that, really a nice lady. And she said, what if it's really a real thing? And I said, okay, let me make sure I got this now. So you're saying, what if the thing on the list is a real thing? And she goes, yeah. And I said, yeah, make sure you get it on the list. That's the answer. And she goes, oh, I got it. Get it on the list. It's just another dumb idea. Any thought you have on why you can't succeed is by definition a stupid thought. You, you got to get that. If you go, well, there's this thing, but it's really fantastic. That's a dumb thought. Why would you want to be in agreement with something that's going to screw it up for you? And that's all it is. Did that make sense for you? Anybody have a question on that? Any question, anything, let Kelly know. I think we're getting close on time. So I wanna make sure if you have a question, uh, I'm not out of time, but I wanna make sure if somebody has a question on something, I, I wanna answer it if I can. Yep, we've got one in there, Russell. What is your opinion on buying leads? Well, it depends on if they're good leads. Um, uh, over the years, there's probably few lead sources that I haven't tried. I don't want to say I've tried them all, but pretty close. And sometimes something that was good at one time it later isn't. And if you said, why? I don't know. If, like, let me give an example. There was a time Zillow was actually, they were good leads and they were better than most leads. 
They were more expensive, but they were actually better leads. Are they that fantastic today? No. Why? Uh, they've changed things. They keep changing them. And so I, I don't know that I could answer a question like what changed on the leads, but there's no question that the quality of those leads went down. So if you buy leads, I wouldn't sign up for like a year on something. Like we've been farting around with Realtor.com and taking several runs at it, but it's not panning out. I think we're at a thousand, not very much, but we're at a thousand a month. But if you said, has it been profitable? No, not at all. But I know people who have done stuff with Realtor.com that are just so happy they have. So I don't want to start bad. I'm not, this isn't bad mousing the quality of those leads, but you'd have to look and go, if you get them, uh, you have to sign up for a long-term commitment and are they worth keeping? Are, or is it a profitable thing to buy them? I don't want to say don't do it, but I also don't want to say, yeah, do it. Um, I don't know of any of them that are so good. Like if you took Zillow, the fact that they from time to time have these things open up where they're now for sale, which means the guy or gal, the man or woman who used to buy that lead, they're not working for them, so they gave them up. That's just the point, I would say. So I, I wouldn't just say, yes, buy leads. And none of those leads are ever going to be as good as you either holding an open house on some other listing for, for, with somebody with the company, like if you're with my home group, there are probably, I don't know, three or 400 listings that my, some my home group agent has that they're not holding open. You could, I mean, we have the same thing at Realty One. You, you, just, you don't have to have listings to hold open houses. Just find an agent with your company that'll let you hold an open house. And particularly if it's vacant, there's no reason for them not to. So anyway, you, you, you want to take something that works for you and you don't have to get good at everything. Like I was never particularly good at open houses. So if you said, Did, have I ever sold listing? Oh God, yes, I've done them. Have I sold houses, gotten listing? But it wasn't my strength. I have a friend, it's what she does. She works with Callaways. It's what she does almost every day. She's at an open house. She gets a lot of business from it. Now, do I want to say, don't do them, do them? I No, do them if you get good at something and then do them, do it. So then I get that question answered. I think so, but two people chimed in. What one lead would work or what are some ideas that have worked for you for lead gen? Say it again, say it again, Kelly. I couldn't yeah, so I'm buying, what one lead would work? And then someone else said, any other lead generation ideas that have worked for you? Well, let, let's take out, when you're talking about lead generation ideas, let's take out marketing in the sense that like, could you run a TV ad? Yes, but it's probably going to fail because if you've never done it, I wouldn't recommend doing it. And it's just, it's very expensive. And if you're off by even a little bit, you're off by a mile on something like that. I would say uh, there's just nothing to compare to getting good at prospecting. Uh, like, can you buy leads from Google on pay-per-click? Now, is that something I'm real smart on? No, but there are people that are. But one of the things with all of those leads that you would say any real success, you go to like, like say Boomtown, let's take that one. It's not the instantaneous, look what we did on lead conversion when the lead came in, it's the follow-up. It's the continuous follow-up. So do you have a follow-up system? Do you stay in touch with them? Like if you called, I don't know, let's say, hell, let's say you door knock, like when Mike Ferry was saying you should door knock, and don't keep going back to the same neighborhood because that's like farming. He really did have that viewpoint, which was sort of nutty, but let this list, but there were people that went to Mike Ferry seminars that got in the, that literally went out, would go out and knock on 100, 150 doors a day, every day. Did they get business? Yes, they got business. 
Do I think it's the smartest use of my time? No, but you could take, you know, it's like, it's like one time I remember this exercise guru uh, and somebody asked him, what is the best exercise to do? And he said, the one you'll do. And it would be the same thing here. You, there's, there's dozens of ways you could approach people. Which one's the best? The one that you'll do. The thing that's the key is if you said, if the, if the most important activity, see if you've got so many deals flying around that you don't have time to prospect, then you absolutely have to have an assistant so you can do what matters the most, you understand? But if you don't have all those deals, you've got nothing but time. So you could do an experiment and find out what kind of lead generation activity that doesn't cost anything except your time and your energy, what one works the best for you? Knocking on doors, uh, calling on the phone, showing up in person, going to see people you know. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, of, of not so much cold calling, but warm calling. Like if you sort of know them, go say hi. And, and let me just point out to you, in fact, here's probably something I wanna cover anyway. And I think it's the most important thing I could teach anyone. Let's take the concept of you have call reluctance. And if you haven't been out making a lot of calls in person, you have call reluctance. Let me reframe it. You have stage fright with an audience of one. I'm gonna say that again. You have stage fright with an audience of one. And let's talk about what stage fright is because I want you to get past it. Stage fright is when you have your attention in on yourself, wondering what they're thinking about you. There's two places you could have your attention. One is out on the world around you. And the other place is in on yourself. And if we talked about in on yourself and called it introversion, and we talked about out on the world and people around you, extroversion, extroversion is healthy, good, sane, productive, it's awesome. Introversion is always, whether you realize it or not, looking for something wrong with you. There are people that you know and have come in contact with that tend to introvert you. They make statements or they ask questions that cause your attention to go off of them and in, in on yourself. I would tell you, be aware of that. Uh, there's nothing about it that's good. When I say nothing, I mean precisely nothing. It, some people, it's an art form, like a passive aggressive turd. They just can't wait to get people to introvert. Uh, it's a rather sickening desire if someone's doing it on purpose. If you know there's people like that in your environment, don't ever take the bait. Uh, don't drink alcohol around them. Don't show up hungry. Don't show up tired. Anything that introverts you, I could put into the destructive category. And anything that extroverts you and makes you feel good, I could put into the productive category. There are people, there are activities, and there are places that when you're there or with them or doing that, you're really happy and your attention gets extroverted. And if you want a little cheat type system, do that thing that you love or go around. You could say, well, that my friend Mary or my fr friend Philip or whatever. It is. You, you're with that guy or her and you think, I'm so happy. Do that or pet your dog or whatever it is that you love, do that before you go lead generating. See, it is easy if you never get hit to go, hey, I'm always in a really fantastic mood. But I started with how do you stay in a fantastic mood? You don't stay in a fantastic mood. You can't unless you're a lunatic. I mean, I'm serious. 
if someone you love dearly dies, you're not going to be in a fantastic mood. You're just not. But if you have no goals that you keep in making real to yourself, it's going to be very difficult for you to get back on track because you were never on track. But if you have a clear idea of what your goals are and you get bumped off the track, you, you can get back on the track and you can find there's things like it's like, what do I do for my staff? What do I do for my uh, salespeople? We have a weekly meeting and my job, my, literally my job is to help them and make sure they get rid of any dumb ideas or any little crap they've had stick to them in the previous week. We do it every week. And my goal, as it's really the whole purpose of what am I doing here in this talk right now, of getting you to put your attention out on the world around you, where it belongs, and put your attention on your goals. And if someone or something introverts you, that's not good. Anyone, see, because you, you, you're already going to have dumb thoughts. And those dumb thoughts attach to other dumb thoughts. And I'm not trying to take them up or do analyze them or blah, blah, blah. My point is, you put your attention on what you want, not what you don't want. It's interesting sometimes when people are asked, what would you like most? And they'll start explaining what they don't want. For you to not want something and fixate on not wanting it on a mental level is precisely the same as if you said, that's my goal. You know, the old trick of don't think of an elephant. It's the same thing. So if you go, I don't want any more deals falling out of escrow. Really? So you can stop all deals from falling out of escrow? What, what, what technique will you be using? Make the goal something you can actually go, I'm going to close X number of deals. Does that mean if, you're, if you were going to close X number of deals, you're going to have a certain percentage, it's usually around 10%, fall out of escrow. Why? Because it happens. It goes with the territory. You're not going to be an exception. You're going to have deals fall out of escrow. You're going to have listings that don't sell. You're going to have buyers that didn't buy from you after you showed them. If you focus on that and keep trying to remember that crappy, my God, you'll make yourself crazy. Put your attention on what you want. But I'm telling you, if you'll go to the number one home agent uh, website and, and take a look at that, the two uh, posts I made on enemy line, you'll see all of this laid out specifically. So any, any other questions, anything I didn't address, anything? Um, we got a couple people, Russell, that want to hear this most popular question right now. Okay. Any advice on getting offers accepted in this multiple offer market? Say, say it again, about multiple offers. Yes, any oh, advice yeah. on getting your offer accepted in today's multiple offer market? I don't think I have any special insight. I, I really don't. Um, are you going to, when you have multiple offers, and I mean, I talked to people, they, they had, they wrote on 15 different houses and they still hadn't gotten one. Uh, some of the strategies, like let's pretend the buyer can afford 400. I would make it my business not to show them anything above 350. You can start with that because you're going to get into competitive bidding. There's no way around it. You're going to get into competitive bidding and if, if they qualify for 400 and you show them a house for 400, you've already lost. You understand? You, you, you've just fit, you've set it up to where that's a lose. Because as soon as the bid goes to 410 or 415, you, you're like, we're, we're, we're tapped out. They don't have the difference in cash. So you'd have to show them houses that are cheaper so that they can bid it up. Because how fast are the prices rising? We're still startled sometimes. We had one we listed for 450. It looked like it might be high. It sold for 500. When it got to who's who's going to pay them? That well, we'll we'll pay five for it, and go and we don't care if there's a difference on the appraisal. We'll pay the difference. We want that house. That's not unusual. 
So the first thing you'd want to do is set up to win. Like, what could you do to win? Um, so you, there's always something you can do, but I don't know that there's some special secret thing, but I would start on a strategy of show them stuff that's less expensive so that you're prepared to, to, to go up on that. Cause that's really what's going to happen when the rubber meets the road. So I hope that helped. Anything else, anything. Well, why don't we wrap up with this one? Erica says she's been a agent since 1997 and is suffering PTSD from 2005. How do you move past that? I think it's a wonderful question. And on that same website, I want you to look for a seminar and there's a booklet attached to it. The seminar is called The Two Types of People. And the booklet is called The Cause of Suppression. And I want you to, if you go to that, the, the website, the, all, all, uh, numberonehomeagent.com, and in the search box, search for Two Types of People. And you'll see the little booklet and it's entitled The Cause of Suppression. You can download a PDF of that booklet there on that site. And uh, it, after you read the booklet and your seminar, it's a recorded, I think it's about a 90 minute seminar that I gave and it was recorded. And then if you still have any questions, you probably will, uh, if you still, let's just say you've, you've watched that video and you've read the booklet, uh, send me a message of some kind of text or go through uh, what do you call messenger or send me an email at the office, whatever. And I'll, I'll talk to you and answer your questions. So that, that, that's the first thing I would tell you to do. Because when you get hit like that and you're still sort of stuck in it, uh, there's a specific thing that happened. I don't know what it is, but there, there's, there's something that got stuck. And there was something earlier than that, it got stuck too. And we just wanna unstick it to where you're not sort of stuck in the past. Anything wrong with a person anywhere, always, is nothing but a stuck picture. When I say a picture, the mind is composed of mental image pictures. You could really call them facsimiles of the experience you had. And some of those facsimiles you really can't see, but that doesn't mean it's not pressing against you in some way. And that's what this is. And there's a couple of simple techniques but it'll just start, read that booklet very carefully and listen to that seminar. And then anything still stuck, I, I can talk to you and unstick it. So anyway, that's a wonderful, thank you for that. It's Erica, thank you for that question. I'm glad I got a chance to answer that for you. Good, good. And I think we're all caught up with questions. So if we want to summarize, everyone is thanking you like crazy in the chat. So Lots of gratitude. Say it again. I, didn't, I couldn't get the very last. Everyone, oh. you said something right there, honey. They're thanking you and thanking you. Lots of gratitude. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. It's my pleasure. I really enjoyed this. And uh, you guys are with, if you're with my home, you're with a great company. And it's just uh, Jeremy and Mark are just awesome people. And they the, the people they have working for them and with them are also just terrific. And anyway, it's a pleasure. And we can do this whenever you want to again, sweetie. You call you holler. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks, everybody. It's my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.